2001, A Space Odyssey. Arthur C. Clarke. Read by Media Gitao. Part 1. Primeval Night. Chapter 1. The Road to Extinction. The drought had lasted now for ten million years, and the reign of the terrible lizards had long since ended. Here on the equator, in the continent which would one day be known as Africa, the battle for existence had reached a new climax of ferocity, and the victor was not yet in sight. In this barren and desiccated land, only the small or the swift or the fierce could flourish, or even hope to survive. The man-apes of the Velts were none of these things, and they were not flourishing. Indeed, they were already far down the road to racial extinction. About fifty of them occupied a group of caves overlooking a small, parched valley, which was divided by a sluggish stream fed from snows in the mountains two hundred miles to the north. In bad times the stream vanished completely, and the tribe lived in the shadow of thirst. <clears throat> it was always hungry and now it was starving. When the first faint glow of dawn crept into the cave, Moonwatcher saw that his father had died in the night. He did not know that the old one was his father, for such a relationship was utterly beyond his understanding, but as he looked at the emaciated body, he felt a dim disquiet that was the ancestor of sadness. The two babies were already whimpering for food, but became silent when Moonwatcher snarled at them. One of the mothers, defending the infant she could not properly feed, gave him an angry growl in return. He lacked the energy even to cuff her for her presumption. Now it was light enough to leave. Moonwalker picked up the shriveled corpse and dragged it after him as he bent under the low overhang of the cave. Once outside, he threw the body over his shoulder and stood upright, the only animal in all this world able to do so. Among his kind, Moonwatcher was almost a giant. <clears throat> he was nearly five feet high, and though badly undernourished, weighed over a hundred pounds. His hairy, muscular body was halfway between ape and man, but his head was already much nearer to man than ape. The forehead was low, and there were ridges over the eye sockets, yet he unmistakably held in his genes the promise of humanity. As he looked out upon the hostile world of the Pleistocene, there was already something in his gaze beyond the capacity of any ape. In those dark, deep-set eyes was a dawning awareness, the first intimations of an intelligence that could not possibly fulfill itself for ages yet, and might soon be extinguished forever. There was no sign of danger, so Moonwatcher began to scramble down the almost vertical slope outside the cave, only slightly hindered by his burden. As if they had been waiting for his signal, the rest of the tribe emerged from their own homes farther down the rock face and began to hasten toward the muddy waters of the stream for their morning drink. Moonwatcher looked across the valley to see if the others were in sight, but there was no trace of them. Perhaps they had not yet left their caves or they were already foraging farther along the hillside. Since they were nowhere to be seen, Moonwatcher forgot them. He was incapable of worrying about more than one thing at a time. First, he must get rid of the old one, but this was a problem that demanded little thought. There had been many deaths this season, one of them in his own cave. He had only to put the corpse where he had left the new baby at the last quarter of the moon, and the hyenas would do the rest. They were already waiting, where the little valley fanned out into the savannah, almost as if they had known that he was coming. Moonwatcher left the body under a small bush, all the earlier bones were already gone, and hurried back to rejoin the tribe. He never thought of his father again. 
His two mates, the adults from the other caves, and most of the youngsters were foraging among the drought-stunted trees farther up the valley, looking for berries, succulent roots and leaves, and occasional windfalls like small lizards or rodents. Only the babies and the feeblest of the old folk were left in the caves. If there was any surplus food at the end of the day's searching, they might be fed. If not, the hyenas would soon be in luck once more. But this day was a good one. Though as Moon Watcher had no real remembrance of the past, he could not compare one time with another. He had found a hive of bees in the stump of a dead tree, and so had enjoyed the finest delicacy that his people could ever know. He still licked his fingers from time to time as he led the group homeward in the late afternoon. Of course, he had also collected a fair number of stings, um, but he had scarcely noticed them. He was now as near to contentment as he was ever likely to be, for though he was still hungry, he was not actually weak with hunger. That was the most to which any man-ape could ever aspire. His contentment vanished when he reached the stream. The others were there. They were there every day, but that did not make it the less annoying. There were about thirty of them, and they could not have been distinguished from the members of Moon Watcher's own tribe. As they saw him coming, they began to dance, shake their arms, and shriek on their side of the stream, and his own people replied in kind. And that was all that happened. Though the man-apes often fought and wrestled one another, their disputes very seldom resulted in serious injuries. Having no claws or fighting canine teeth, and being well protected by hair, they could not inflict much harm on one another. In any event, they had little surplus energy for such unproductive behavior. Snarling and threatening was a much more efficient way of asserting their points of view. The confrontation lasted about five minutes. Then the display died out as quickly as it had begun, and everyone drank his fill of the muddy water. Honor had been satisfied. Each group had staked its claim to its own territory. This important business having been settled, the tribe moved off along its side of the river. The nearest worthwhile grazing was now more than a mile from the caves, and they had to share it with a herd of large, antelope-like beasts who barely tolerated their presence. They could not be driven away, for they were armed with ferocious daggers on their foreheads, the natural weapons which the man-apes did not possess. So Moon Watcher and his companions chewed berries and fruit and leaves and fought off the pangs of hunger, while all around them, competing for the same fodder, was a potential source of more food than they could ever hope to eat. Yet the thousands of tons of succulent meat roaming over the savanna and through the bush was not only beyond their reach, it was beyond their imagination. In the midst of plenty, they were slowly starving to death. The tribe returned to its cave without incidents in the last light of the day. The injured female who had remained behind cooed with pleasure as Moon Watcher gave her the berry-covered branch he had brought back and began to attack it ravenously. There was little enough nourishment here, but it would help her to survive until the wound the leopard had given her had healed and she could forage for herself again. Over the valley a full moon was rising, and a chill wind was blowing down from the distant mountains. It would be very cold tonight, but cold, like hunger, was not a matter for any real concern. It was merely part of the background of life. Moon Watcher barely stirred when the shrieks and screams echoed up the slope from one of the lower caves, and he did not need to hear the occasional growl of the leopard to know exactly what was happening. Down there in the darkness, old Whitehair and his family were fighting and dying, and the thought that he might help in some way never crossed Moon Watcher's mind. The harsh logic of survival ruled out such fancies, and not a voice was raised in protest from the listening hillside. Every cave was silent, lest it also attract disaster. 
The tumult died away, and presently Moonwatcher could hear the sound of a body being dragged over rocks. This lasted only a few seconds, then the leopard got a good hold on its kill. It made no further noise as it padded silently away, carrying its victim effortlessly in its jaws. For a day or two there would be no further danger here, but there might be other enemies abroad, taking advantage of this cold little sun that shone only by night. <clears throat> if there was sufficient warning, the smaller predators could sometimes be scared away by shouts and screams. Moonwatcher crawled out of the cave, clambered onto a large boulder beside the entrance, and squatted there to survey the valley. Of all the creatures who had yet walked on earth, the man-apes were the first to look steadfastly at the moon. And though he could not remember it, when he was a very young moon-watcher, he would sometimes reach out and try to touch that ghostly face rising above the hills. He had never succeeded, and now he was old enough to understand why. For first, of course, he must find a high enough tree to climb. Sometimes he watched the valley, and sometimes he watched the moon, but always he listened. Once or twice he dozed off, but he slept with a hair-trigger alertness, and the slightest sound would have disturbed him. At the great age of twenty-five, he was still in full possession of all his faculties. If his luck continued, and if he avoided accidents, disease, predators, and starvation, he might survive for as much as another ten years. The night wore on, cold and clear, without further alarms, and the moon rose slowly amid equatorial constellations that no human eye would ever see. In the caves between spells of fitful dozing and fearful waiting were being born the nightmares of generations yet to be. And twice there passed slowly across the sky, rising up to the zenith and descending into the east, a dazzling points of light more brilliant than any star. Chapter 2 The New Rock Late that night, Moonwatcher suddenly awoke. Tired out by the day's exertions and disasters, he had been sleeping more soundly than usual, yet he was instantly alert at the first faint scrabbling down in the valley. He sat up in the fetid darkness of the cave, straining his senses out into the night, and fear crept slowly into his soul. Never in his life, already twice as long as most members of his species could expect, had he heard a sound like this. The great cats approached in silence, and the only thing that betrayed them was a rare slide of earth or the occasional cracking of a twig. Yet this was a continuous crunching noise that grew steadily louder. It seemed that some enormous beast was moving through the night, making no attempt at concealment and ignoring all obstacles. Once Moonwatcher heard the unmistakable sound of a bush being uprooted. The elephants in Dinotheria did this often enough, but otherwise they moved as silently as the cats. And then there came a sound which Moonwalker could not possibly have identified, for it had never been heard before in the history of the world. It was the clank of metal upon stone. Moonwatcher came face to face with the new rock when he led the tribe down to the river in the first light of morning. He had almost forgotten the terrors of the night because nothing had happened after that initial noise, so he did not even associate this strange thing with danger or with fear. There was, after all, nothing in the least alarming about it. It was a rectangular slab, three times his height, but narrow enough to span with his arms and it was made of some completely transparent material. Indeed, it was not easy to see except when the rising sun glinted on its edges. As Moonwalker had never encountered ice or even crystal clear water, there were no natural objects to which he could compare this apparition. 
It was certainly rather attractive, and though he was wisely cautious of most new things, he did not hesitate for long before sidling up to it. As nothing happened, he put out his hand and felt a cold, hard surface. After several minutes of intense thought, he arrived at a brilliant explanation. It was a rock, of course, and it must have grown during the night. There were many plants that did this, white pulpy things shaped like pebbles that seemed to shoot up during the hours of darkness. It was true that they were small and round, whereas this was large and sharp-edged. But greater and later philosophers than Moonwatcher would be prepared to overlook equally striking exceptions to their theories. This really superb piece of abstract thinking led Moonwatcher, after only three or four minutes, to a deduction which he immediately put to the test. The white round pebble plants were very tasty, though there were a few that produced violent illness. Perhaps this tall one? A few licks and attempted nibbles quickly disillusioned him. There was no nourishment here, so like a sensible man-ape, he continued on his way to the river and forgot all about the crystalline monolith during the daily routine of shrieking at the others. The foraging today was very bad, and the tribe had to travel several miles from the caves to find any food at all. During the merciless heat of noon, one of the frailer females collapsed far from any possible shelter. <coughs> her companions gathered round her, twittering and meeping sympathetically, but there was nothing that anyone could do. If they had been less exhausted, they might have carried her with them, but there was no surplus energy for such acts of kindness. She had to be left behind to recover or not with her own resources. They passed the spot on the homeward trek that evening. There was not a bone to be seen. In the last light of day, looking round anxiously for early hunters, they drank hastily at the stream and started to climb up to their caves. They were still a hundred yards from the new rock when the sound began. It was barely audible, yet it stopped them dead, so that they stood paralyzed on the trail with their jaws hanging slackly. It was a simple, maddeningly re repetitious vibration. It pulsed out from the crystal and hypnotized all who came within its spell. For the first time, and the last for three million years, the sound of drumming was heard in Africa. The throbbing grew louder, more insistent. Presently the man-apes began to move forward like sleepwalkers toward the source of that compulsive sound. Sometimes they took little dancing steps as their blood responded to rhythms that their descendants would not create for ages yet. Totally entranced, they gathered round the monolith, forgetting the hardships of the day, the perils of the approaching dusk, and the hunger in their bellies. The drumming became louder, the night darker. And as the shadows lengthened and the light drained from the sky, the crystal began to glow. First, it lost its transparency and became suffused with a pale, milky luminescence. Tantalizing, ill-defined phantoms moved across its surface and in its depths. They coalesced into bars of light and shadow, then formed intermeshing, spoked patterns that began slowly to rotate. Faster and faster spun the wheels of light, and the throbbing of the drums accelerated with them. Now utterly hypnotized, the man-apes could only stare slack-jawed into this astonishing display of pyrotechnics. They had already forgotten the instincts of their forefathers and the lessons of a lifetime. Not one of them, ordinarily, would have been so far from his cave so late in the evening for the surrounding brush was full of frozen shapes and staring eyes as the creatures of the night suspended their business to see what would happen next. 
Now the spinning wheels of light began to merge, and the spokes fused into luminous bars that slowly receded into the distance, rotating on their axes as they did so. They split into pairs, and the resulting sets of lines started to oscillate across one another, slowly changing their angles of intersection. Fantastic, fleeting geometrical patterns flickered in and out of existence as the glowing grids meshed and unmeshed, and the man-apes watched, mesmerized captives of the shining crystal. They could never guess that their minds were being probed, their bodies mapped, their reactions studied, their potentials evaluated. At first, the whole tribe remained half-crouching in a motionless tableau, as if frozen into stone. Then the man-ape nearest to the slab suddenly came to life. He did not move from his position, but his body lost its trance-like rigidity and became animated as if it were a puppet controlled by invisible strings. The head turned this way and that, the mouth silently opened and closed, the hands clenched and unclenched. Then he bent down, snapped off a long stalk of grass, and attempted to tie it into a knot with clumsy fingers. He seemed to be a thing possessed, struggling against some spirit or demon who had taken over control of his body. He was panting for breath, and his eyes were full of terror as he tried to force his fingers to make movements more complex than any that they had ever attempted before. Despite all his efforts, he succeeded only in breaking the stalk into pieces. As the fragments fell to the ground, the controlling influence left him, and he froze once more into immobility. Another man-ape came to life and went through the same routine. This was a younger, more adaptable specimen. It succeeded where the other one had failed. On the planet Earth, the first crude knot had been tied. Others did stranger and still more pointless things. Some held their hands out at arm's length, and some tried to touch their fingertips together, first with both eyes open, then with one closed. Some were made to stare at ruled patterns in the crystal, which became more and more finely divided until the lines had merged into a gray blur and all heard single pure sounds of varying pitch that swiftly sank below the level of hearing. <clears throat> when Moonwatcher's turn came, he felt very little fear. His main sensation was a dull resentment, as his, much, as his muscles twitched and his limbs moved at commands that were not wholly his own. Without knowing why, he bent down and picked up a small stone. When he straightened up, he saw that there was a new image in the crystal slab. The grids and the moving, dancing patterns had gone. Instead, there was a series of concentric circles surrounding a small black disk. Obeying the silent orders in his brain, he pitched the stone with a clumsy overarm throw. It missed the target by several feet. Try again, said the command. He searched around until he had found another pebble. This time it hit the slab with a ringing bell-like tone. He was still a long way off, but his aim was improving. At the fourth attempt, he was only inches from the central bullseye. A feeling of indescribable pleasure, almost sexual in its intensity, flooded his mind. Then the control relaxed. He felt no impulse to do anything, except to stand and wait. One by one, every member of the tribe was briefly possessed. Some succeeded, but most failed at the task they had been set, and all were appropriately rewarded by spasms of pleasure or of pain. Now there was only a uniform, featureless glow in the great slab, so that it stood like a block of light superimposed on the surrounding darkness. As if waking from a sleep, the man-apes shook their heads, 
and presently began to move along the trail to their place of shelter. They did not look back or wonder at the strange light that was guiding them to their homes, and to a future unknown as yet, even to the stars.'